Today at the National Press Club, Professor Sharath Saram. Professor Saram leads the Functional Materials and Microsystems Research Group at RMIT. He'll make the case for more investment in science, arguing Australia isn't keeping up with a transforming world. Professor Sharath Saram with today's address. Hello and welcome to today's Westpac address. Professor, Professor Sharif Sriram, sorry, I knew I was going to fall over that, is speaking at, to the National Press Club today in his capacity as President of Science and Technology Australia. His day job is as co-leader of the Functional Materials and Microsystems team at RMIT School of Engineering, which I am told involves translating discoveries at extremely small size scales into technology for electronics, communication and biomedicine. He is described as a research rock star and a connector of commercialisation and is an active contributor to science policy with a focus on innovation and long-term strategy, early and mid-career researchers, diversity and inclusion. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation on X, where our handle is at Press Club Ost, or you can use the hashtag NPC. Please welcome Professor Sriram. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, the energy in this room is buzzing. Uh, and so that is a bit daunting, but we'll go, get going. Uh, thank you very much, Julie, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the NPC board for the opportunity to address you today. I would like to start by acknowledging Cathy Foley, Australia's chief scientist, a very inspiring leader, and I think a mentor to many of us. And I also want to thank MTP Connect, who are supporting this event today and acknowledge their chair, the Honorable Jala Pulford. MTP Connect has dramatically improved our capability to translate ideas into medical products. And I think that's a thread you'll see through some of the aspects of my speech. Welcome to all the fellow scientists and so many of you who support our work. And thank you very much to those of you watching. I'm here to talk to you about Australia's future to talk about why we urgently need deep investment, bold investment in ideas and innovation, and to talk about how we can in turn every dollar we invest into five dollars. And more importantly, to talk about the cost of failing to use our potential and the damage it will do to our future prosperity. So I want to acknowledge the Nunaval people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and to all the First Nation people here today. Now, scientists, many of us here, we embody humanity's timeless curiosity. Now, that curiosity was shared by the original inhabitants of this land. Tens of thousands of years ago, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people looked up at the heavens, looked down at the earth, look down at all the creatures around them. And they've been asking the same question we still ask. How does everything work? And how does it work in harmony? How can we thrive in harmony with one another and with nature? So we should recognize, celebrate, and build on this wealth of knowledge they have created. We often know that we look much further by standing on the shoulders of giants. So in Australian invention, the polymer $50 note features David Nunaipon, so commonly known as David Unaipon. So I'm an engineer and inventor, like him, and I've admired his brilliance and resilience. So in fact, he was considered by many to be Australia's Leonardo da Vinci. So if you've not looked him up, please do. He was a prolific inventor. At that time, he designed an Australian necessity, the handheld wool shearing tool. So it's there on most of our $50 notes, the drawing of this. So the past and the present together. So these things we should always acknowledge. Now, I spoke about curiosity. Australians are inquisitive and inventive. This room is full of people discovering things and creating them, building our country's future. 
So there are teams working on improving health outcomes. They make 3D printed parts to replace damaged bones, to understand how to minimize the complications for people with diabetes. There are those using Australian minerals to make some of the most advanced and safest batteries in the world. And some designing and building microchips for the future of computing, using light or atoms. Now, imagine the possibilities. And referring to what Doug Hilton said this morning at Science Meets Parliament, it creates so much hope and wonder. So how do we use these ideas to make our lives better? Our economy stronger and our future secure? So I'm going to use one example which sums up our challenge as a nation. Now, we all love solar panels. They turn sunlight into clean energy. Australians made this possible. So an award-winning team at the University of New South Wales, Professors Martin Green and Andrew Blakers, with Dr. Aihua Wong and Dr. Jian Hua Zhao, they created this, world-leading science and technology. And in case you don't realize, about eight out of every 10 solar panels in the world uses this Australian technology. All the research done here, but all the development, commercialization, and manufacturing done overseas. So creating enormous companies, billionaires, thousands and thousands upon jobs elsewhere. And that is just one example. The cervical cancer vaccine, implantable pacemakers, Wi-Fi, Google Maps. So we can't keep let, keep let it happening. And we can't keep let history keep repeating. So now, another group of Australian scientists and engineers are improving on solar cell technology at the University of Newcastle. They're creating solar panels that are like sheets of plastic, so thinner than a chip packet. So you can print them quickly, like newspapers. They're light, flexible, recyclable, and cheap. So we could cover entire buildings with these, making them power generators, clean and self-sufficient. Now, such incredible ideas need to be turned into Australian products and Australian jobs. And so we urgently need to retain our ideas. They are our secret recipes our intellectual property. And so if we continue to keep letting these opportunities slip through our hands, history will judge us, and it will judge us badly. So people often say, Australia does not seem to make things anymore. Well, here is our chance. We are here to have this conversation. We can create an advanced manufacturing sector that will diversify our economy. We can create exports, and we can provide highly skilled jobs now and in the future but that will be done by investing now and into the future to create an innovation ecosystem that works. So this is the task for all of us, but frankly, this is also our responsibility. So as you can probably tell, I'm very passionate about this topic. I know hundreds of scientists gathered in Canberra this week for Science Meets Parliament share this passion. So as Julie said at the introduction, I'm Sharat Sriram. I'm a professor at RMIT University, but I'm privileged to be the president of Science and Technology Australia. We represent 225,000 scientists and technologists from 140 organizations. So all of them are passionate about the potential and promise of science. All of them are 100% determined to create a better future for all of us. That's probably the only reason they are in science. Now, everyone in SDA is focused on that future. There isn't a person here today who isn't itching to put their great ideas into practice, to help our people and our planet. And so many already have. Some people help others see and hear better. They create medicines for the harshest illnesses. And so many designed health practices that saved so many lives at the start of the pandemic. Now, there are others battling to save our beautiful marine ecosystems and the farming lands which are facing the ravages of global heating and climate change. I personally focus on using technology to give healthier and better lives to everyone. And I've seen what research into new technologies can do to reduce pain and suffering and prolong life. Like many other scientists here today, I've personally experienced what the failure to take advantage of opportunities means. So I came here 
from my country of birth, India, in the early 2000s. Now, that was a time when Australia still had a chance of creating a sizable microchip industry. That was the time of the IT boom. So, everyone I grew up with wanted to learn to program computers. I was an odd one out. I felt knowing how to build computers that every programmer needs would set me apart. It would make me indispensable. Now, we can always judge whether that was a good choice. <laughs> um, we'll know probably at the end of my career. But computers are full of microchips. So those are what I wanted to make. But what are microchips? Now, the smartphone everyone carries, they have an average of 12 billion transistors and thousands of other electronic components. So when you look at electronics, you'll see these small black squares. Now these black squares are microchips. They are the secret sauce of how electronics work. They contain all the smarts. And every day we rely on thousands of these. In our phones and laptops, a fridge and a microwave, the operation and safety of every single car, Bluetooth headphones, much more. So in 1999, the Victorian gov state government had invested $7 million to purchase software which is used for the design of microchips. Industry and universities came together and they created a postgraduate program called Chip Skills. Now it was a true partnership. So different universities actually came together. They were offering courses they were the best at. It was in partnership with TAFEs for technical certification and internships with large electronics companies. And these companies were from Korea, Japan, Germany, besides those having bases in Australia. They were all investing in Australia as they saw the potential, they saw the discoveries and the talent. Now starting with 30 students, this program ended up with over 200 a year. I was one of those students. But despite this interest from these companies, the lack of mechanisms to commercialize products or to invest and build large facilities meant these companies exist, exited Australia within that decade. Now this was a massive missed opportunity and the consequences are still playing out today. Like I said, microchips seem to control our life but they are at the heart of every advance our country is prioritizing and investing in. Quantum computing, artificial intelligence, digital health, advanced manufacturing, clean energy. They all rely on the technology. So take NVIDIA. It's now the third most valuable company on the stock market. It's doubled its value in three months to two trillion dollars. Why? Because they make microchips for AI. OpenAI, which created ChatGPT, they are trying to raise seven trillion US dollars. That's right, seven trillion to build microchip manufacturing capabilities to manage future needs. And Singapore last month committed $1 billion over five years to secure supply of AI microchips, while India has recently approved four microchip manufacturing facilities. So this is what Australia has missed out on. Imagine what could we could have been doing if we were making microchips here and supplying the world. So many scientists around the country, and that includes me, have had to constantly reinvent ourselves. We invent things, we reinvent things to manage every missed opportunity. Often, we've had to pivot to other fields. So, we may not make microchips here, but we are finding inventive ways to use them. That's what I've done. So with the team I lead with Professor Madhubaskaran at RMIT University, we've been working with companies in this space. So we help companies transform their great ideas into incredible products developing medical technologies to identify illnesses and keep people healthier for long. More importantly, with these companies, we help them navigate barriers to accessing funding, to understand the ecosystem, and to make their ideas come true. So, how many of you have an elderly relative living alone? Or in a residential aged care facility? That's a lot. Or it's going to happen in the near future. Now this makes us anxious, especially overnight, at they are at a high risk of falls and injuries. Now, a Melbourne-based company, Sleep Tight, wanted to get rid of that anxiety. 
They'd been searching the world for five years to make a smart bed for aged care monitoring. Now, founded by the husband and wife team of Cameron and Alison Vanden Dungen, so Cam is here, you can probe him later, they wanted to unobtrusively monitor the well-being of an elderly person overnight. In 2013 at RMIT, we had created a technology to make soft and unbreakable electronics. So electronics on rubber, they don't break, they repair themselves. We were searching for ways to use them practically. A chance meeting, and in two and a half years, we went from a concept to a product, taking this expensive microchip technology, turning it into a simple printed technology, like making t-shirts and iron-on labels. So a product that could be cost competitive for use in aged care facilities. So these rubber-based electronics became smart medical-grade mattress covers. So there's no devices to wear, no devices to charge, just a product near the user, a nearable. So as researchers, we've had to help Sleep Tight navigate grant programs at every stage, from the first one through to manufacturing, through to medical device regulation, and navigate a system which is a mystery to industry. So. For Sleep Tight, we also created special ink recipes for printing. So this was Sleep Tight and RMIT secret sauce. Unfortunately, we've had to send this overseas because there was a lack of prototyping facilities locally at that stage. So we've risked valuable IP by sharing it, not a secret anymore. So this highlights one of our challenges. Similarly, my second example is Atmo Biosciences. So Atmo is making a world first in Melbourne. Gas sensing capsules that you can swallow to provide insight into gut health. Professor Kurosh Kalanta Zade and I were brainstorming with a PhD student, <coughs> Majid Noor, on whether we could make very thin membranes that separate gases. Our vision then was to separate hydrogen to make miniature fuel cells. So imagine powering your phone by splitting water vapor in air so you don't have to charge your phone. Well, that failed, as with most research projects. <laughs> but we did learn something, and that's the power of research. We pivoted. We found we could separate gases that are commonly found in our stomach. So why does this matter? I'm sure you know someone with a digestive problem, or it could be you with special needs for what you can eat. Now, every stomach ailment or allergy is linked to the mixture of gases in your stomach. So another PhD student, Kyle Berrien, built on these findings to lead the development of a capsule to measure gases in one's stomach. That was a breakthrough, except there was no money to make these smart capsules. A researcher's life, I don't have to preach to the converted. The main funding source for engineers is the Australian Research Council. They do not fund medical research. The National Health and Medical Research Council wouldn't fund it because the technology wasn't advanced enough. Now, this is a constant source of frustration to researchers. And yes, MTP Connect didn't exist then, which might have helped. The governing legislations are old. They are not suited to today's world. The boldest problems are solved by bringing disciplines together. So call it luck, the resilience or stubbornness of scientists but eventually the project got funded. But do not believe it, it was funded through the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> so they saw its use in finding out what to feed cows <laughs> so that they expel lesser methane. Meat and livestock industry is the big contributor to atmospheric carbon. So that project succeeded. The gas sensing capsules worked in cows, then were tested in sheep. So a Melbourne-based product development company, Planet Innovation, licensed the technology from RMIT and set up Atmo Biosciences. The PhD student I mentioned developing this, Kyle Berrien, is now the chief technology officer of Atmo Biosciences. Atmo recently reached a very successful benchmark. 1,000 of their capsules have been successfully swallowed by people <laughs> and successfully ejected. So. <laughs> Now, that's Australian ingenuity <laughs> and persistence helping understand gut health. A third example I'm going to give you, given my background, is a microchip. One that can rapidly screen for diseases and using just a smartphone. 
So we designed this technology with a vision of one day having smart toothbrushes. It's measuring your health from your saliva. So you build your profile every day, identify risks. We want to stop diseases before they happen. We all know the usual adage, prevention is better than cure. So we asked ourselves, can we stop a heart attack before it happens? We know we can, based on the data we have. But we are currently using these sensors for technology in women's health to detect preeclampsia, which can be a silent killer, to take the stress out of IVF with a Melbourne-based startup called Cymex Labs. So remember microchips? These technologies are fully enabled by them. I use these examples because I've personally ridden the bumpy journey to turn these ideas into products and solutions. Now, others here today, I'm sure you've engaged in similar. There are many of you running startup businesses with enormous potential. They too have high hopes, facing high hurdles. So I know what they're going through, and hopefully there are some lessons we can all share. Now, their great research and ideas and the products, services, and jobs they can create should never be at the risk of falling over or being lost overseas. But the necessary investment in systems to keep them progressing at a rapid rate and keep them in Australia just isn't there. So what's really holding us back? The shortest answer is a lack of strategy and bold investment. What all these stories highlight is the need for deep, long-term and sustained funding. Strategy with boldness so that Australia can nurture and benefit from the next wave of breakthroughs. And we cannot escape this fact. Our woefully low investment in R&D is holding our country back. It's leading to our best ideas going overseas to our international competitors. And when we give up our ideas, our intellectual property, it's never coming back. We are just going to pay more for the same products pay more for the same services. We need to realize that our IP is like gold dust. And like these small shiny particles, they will slip through our hands if we don't grab on tightly. And we have to do it in a timely manner. Ideas are precious. They are the source of future jobs and growth. They really are our national inheritance. We need the right processes and structures in place to keep them here, reap the benefits here. And then we can sell them to the world. So, what are we doing wrong? The numbers really tell the tale. Australia's spending on R&D as a percentage of GDP has been on the decline for more than a decade. Many of you might have heard uh, these numbers. We now spend just 1.6% of our GDP on R&D. If you think of it, less than two cents to every dollar moving around in our economy is spent on R&D. That is well below the OECD average of 2.7%, and a country mile behind all the other top performers. We usually compare things to the United States. They spend more than double the amount, 3.5% of their GDP. South Korea, I'm sure most of your houses have products from South Korea, spends almost triple the amount at 4.9%. So through COVID, countries realize the value of science, obviously for multiple reasons. But they also realized the crucial importance of sovereign capabilities. So most countries ramped up their investment dramatically. Australia did not. As a consequence, we fell further behind. So I've spoken of microchips. During COVID, we had critical shortages of microchips. We could not build medical equipment. Cars did not have parts. We had to remove safety features. Projected wait times on orders for microchips blew out to years well over 11 years and beyond. So the US responded with the Chips and Science Act, investing 280 billion US dollars in new funding to boost domestic research and manufacturing of semiconductors. We are failing to keep up in such a tech transforming world. So Harvard University publishes the Atlas of Economic Complexity. This ranks Australia 93rd out of 133 countries. So 93rd. Uh, would we accept being 93rd at the Olympics? <laughs> I'm sure we'll turn our country upside down. So if it's unacceptable for sports, how is it acceptable for innovation? 
and we are going backwards. So 10 years ago, we were 81st. So we've slipped 12 places. So our economic competitors are learning, maturing, getting wealthier. We are going in the opposite direction. So damningly, the Atlas says we've not even started the process of diversifying our economy. That we have not even started structural transformation to develop high value industries. So we all hear this normally, we're still reliant on digging things and selling them. And that leaves us extremely exposed to fluctuations in global commodity prices. So our wealth is determined by out things outside our control. And we are being left behind as technology advances. So surely, we can be smart enough to take the resources we have and make valuable products and to take the wealth from the resources and turn them into long-term benefit. We can create large future funds that invest in innovation, both fundamental research and translation. Other countries can do this, and so should we. Now, all this is quite an indictment and a rather embarrassing one. Our choices right now on how we support our ideas and our inventors is going to define Australia's future. It's going to define our well-being and our prosperity. So to maintain our standard of living, we need to increase our R&D expenditure to 3% of the GDP as fast as we can. And that is how we will create a thriving innovation system that we need. An innovation system that will transform our ideas and discoveries into products, services, and jobs. Now, if we were investing 3% of the GDP in R&D right now, the economy would be $100 billion and 42,000 jobs better off. I will say that again. $100 billion better off with an additional 42,000 high-value jobs. And this is a conservative estimate. Those 42,000 new jobs would transform Australia's economy. The people doing these jobs would be saving lives, improving our well-being, contributing and growing, to the econ growing our economy. But they're not there. These jobs don't exist. And those ideas have not become inventions. And that's the cost of our current inaction. So I know some of you would be thinking, can we afford this during a cost of living crunch? The economic benefits of R&D investment cannot be disputed. So for example, very early stage research, funded by the Australian Research Council, returns $3.32 to the economy for every dollar invested. Research further along the innovation pipeline, supported through the Cooperative Research Centers programs, have higher returns. They return more than five and a half dollars for every dollar invested. So if you think of that, would you say no to a threefold or fivefold return on your investments, on your superannuation? That's pretty much what the country is saying right now. So right now, we are missing these crucial investments in development, commercialization, and manufacturing pipeline. So universities and research institutes, we all know, are doing the heavy lifting in Australia's R&D system, doing a way bigger share than any other comparable country or economy in the world. Now, that research is world class. We've had all the rankings, all the metrics, but it also has real world applications and need to partner with businesses to do much more. And Australian business R&D expenditure is 0.89% of the GDP. <coughs> so that's two and a half times lower than the US, four times lower than in South Korea. So we need to get that figure up significantly. But having said that, neither business or government can do everything on their own. The three parts of our innovation ecosystem need to work in cohesion. Universities and research institutes generating ideas, willingly working with business and transforming them into products, and government championing the effort. It should be with strategic incentives and creating efficiencies. And it will take the right investment incentives along with these additional dollars and the right connected innovation ecosystem to bring it all together. So when I say a connected innovation ecosystem, I mean an end-to-end -end system which is obvious. How do you take a great idea, make it a product or service? And how do you also take that great idea and find multiple uses for that innovation? 
to draw maximum value for society. So typically, we have an idea. We test and see how it works. This is the vital discovery research that often happens in universities. And in many cases, there will be unexpected findings. Next, we have to test how it can be used in different ways for different purposes. Once we've developed proven applications, we need to take them to market. This means user testing, manufacturing. It means having the skilled workers and facilities to build things. And it means regulations to make sure our new ideas are safe, meet their purpose, and the new industries we build are sustainable. Sadly, this ecosystem doesn't fully exist. The companies I mentioned earlier in examples, Sleep Tight and Atmo Biosciences, highlight that. Having navigated these processes, I know that a smart country like ours can do better than that. Now, creating this ecosystem is crucial, and failing to build it will have big consequences. I use the $100 billion and 42,000 jobs number. Those are the sort of consequences. We simply must make Australia a country of innovation. Then comes the question, what if we don't? What then? And I think we'll have to face a new reality. <coughs> Australia's standing as one of the richer nations of the earth is not a given, especially not now, as coal and gas lose their appeal and other nations overtake us on technology development. If we fail to diversify, if we don't become an innovation-driven economy, we will be a nation of consumers rather than creators. We will end up paying an ever-increasing rent to the rest of the world. Think of the health implications. Medicines, medical technology, skilled medical specialists, all will be far more expensive and potentially harder to source whenever there's disruptions. Now, with our rapidly aging and growing population, we are soon going to need the equivalent of a billion dollar hospital wing every week added to our medical system. Now, that's not realistic. So technology can keep us healthier, at home for longer. As I said, prevention is always better than cure. Similarly, think of what it means for our environment in the face of climate change. Our environment is unique, which is what makes it attractive. And we will need unique solutions to save our rivers. They are already in huge trouble. Our farming land goes from being flooded one season to drought ravage the next. And of course, the Great Barrier Reef, one of our best assets, another bleaching event recently. So the answers to our environmental problems won't come from off the shelf. We can't buy them in. For our unique system, we need to find our solutions. We need to find them ourselves. So in today's world, it's more important to be a smart country than a lucky one. There is a lot at stake. Our life expectancy, our standard of living, our national prestige, our flora and fauna, our national security. But get it right, and it will create a brighter future we all want, a new era of opportunity. Well, that's the boldness and investment I wanted to talk to you about, to turn our potential into prosperity. We need Australia to invest 3% of GDP in R&D as soon as possible. Unless we become a smarter country, we are doomed to become a poorer one. A cynic would say that scientists and academics are bound to say things like this. And a cynic would say, everyone asks for more money. Now, this is much bigger than that. This is not just spending money. This is an investment. It will save money and livelihoods and lives. This is an investment to ensure our future <laughs> prosperity. And I think that's a story everyday Australians get. They may not look at graphs of R&D spending, but they enjoy the benefits technology brings. The acceleration of AI, the expansion of renewables, the breakthroughs being made in medical technology and medical research. And they do see a country whose economic base is looking a little tired and old-fashioned a country that is starting to fall behind, and one that needs an injection of new ideas and new sources of national income and jobs. 
They want the ideas, the prosperity, and the jobs, and the security for our country that will result from it. So, and the scientists and technologists of Australia, many gathered here today, stand ready to help you create the brighter future. Thank you. get into my iPad. Um, thank you so much. Um, you certainly brought the mood down a bit. Uh, <laughs> not intentionally, but it's a fairly bleak message that you brought here today. Um, you've pointed to falling um, investment in R&D in Australia. I think it's been in decline since about 2011. Um, Science Minister Ed Husick said with some confidence at the beginning of the Albanese government's term that he expected to get R&D back up to 3% by 2030. It would seem there is no way on earth that that is now achievable given the current trajectory. So what's happening? Why is the government not hearing your message? Why hasn't it got on board the train that you're, you're so convincingly, um, I don't know if you can sell trains, but selling that train. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is unfortunate that you have to add a tone of doom to this. But everyone in science is there because of the hope it presents. It is a rough journey. A lot of things don't work. But we do it because of the opportunity for our future. Now, the pleasing thing is it is the labor platform that they want to invest 3% of the GDP. Mm. The prime minister has said it. Minister Husik is like a kid in a candy shop when talking about science and innovation and opportunities. It is a challenge, though, as they're having to balance priorities on what to invest in. And my message here is this has to be a super high priority because it's not just a spend, it's an investment. And thinking it through that lens, I think, will hopefully help change the conversation. Um, they aspire for 3% of the GDP by 2030. If they could do it by flicking a magic switch, we would all love it. But I think we all at least need a clear path to how we are getting there. And a more stable strategy which brings the parts of the ecosystem together. And so what would be the stepping off point? What would be the first thing? Would it be investment in block grant funding for universities? Would it be, where would that investment go for, according to your kind of vision for the future? The government's single biggest tool in R&D investment currently is the R&D tax incentive. Hmm. In some ways, it's a blunt instrument. There have been reviews of this encouragement to actually create more collaboration premium, such that you can actually force businesses and researchers to work together. I mean, force is a crude word, yeah, because that partnership is like a relationship. I always say it's like a marriage. You have to get into it for the long term, value each other's priorities, and make it work. But you need to create systems which make that happen effectively, and especially when taxation and the dollars are a big tool and incentive, we could do it better. But there are other opportunities. Other countries have different forms of R&D tax incentive. The way it can operate as a credit instead of an offset. So you're forced to spend money that year. That means you're more innovative. You're looking for solutions faster. So there are some structural things we could address sooner. Okay. But there is, but there is the argument that the kind of the structural nature of the Australian economy is unlike big economies like the US or Germany or Japan and that you know, where our, our economy is made up of a lot of small to medium businesses which are not known for their innovative strengths. So it seems like, you know, things that apply and work overseas aren't necessarily going to apply and work as easily here. I think the opportunity here is to demystify the system. I work with a lot of SMEs and startups. They want to be ahead of the curve. They know they need to have new opportunities. They need to be producing technology which keeps them selling their products to all markets. But sometimes the processes are so complex, they feel it's just too hard. And I think it should never be the attitude of it's too hard. And as long as we can remove the barriers and make that happen, 80% of our economy is driven by SMEs and startups. And so yeah, we need to get them really, make it much easier for them to participate in the R&D effort. Okay, but people talk about, you know, trying to deal with universities and they find them 
like these giant walls that they can't climb over because they just can't understand. There's different languages, there's different cultures. Um, you know, people t seem to be talking at cross purposes. So is it, does the cultural change need to come from business, from universities? How do we bring the two together? I, I think it's a cultural change which all of us have to participate in. Universities can be challenged to deal with and a lot of the researchers here have, have a role to play. They can again demystify the system. For example, at Science and Technology Australia, we've been promoting a lot of training and professional development opportunities for young researchers. One of our key objectives is to create what we are calling the bench to boardroom program. So that we can train people in having these conversations, making these commercial decisions. So they can even change the culture of the university. If they know why these decisions are made, they can make stronger arguments so that it becomes a seamless process. But I agree, it has to be every part of the economy. But I'll go back to where I said it's a bit like a marriage. You need to understand the values which lie in each place. Our universities have been forced into a different metrics model based on ranking, which doesn't converge with the space and the solution we focus industry needs. And so both parties understanding their sides and coming to a compromise which works for our ecosystem matters. Mm. We need to forget that competitive spirit. It's a combined spirit towards Australian prosperity. Okay, so, so I mean that kind of leads to the point that, you know, there's been rumblings for many years about too much effort being put into the production of papers and peer-reviewed journals um, that far too few people read and which have very little outward impact. Is that a valid criticism and how do we move the science from the journals into the real world? I think that's a two-part answer to that. Investing in fundamental research is key. Uh, I mentioned so many examples. We'll take Wi-Fi, which everyone uses. It was scientists trying to unscramble radio waves in a room, which caused Wi-Fi. They didn't set out to discover Wi-Fi. Mm. Um, a lot of the products I mentioned, like the Atmo capsule, we weren't looking to make a gas sensing capsule. We started somewhere else. So investing in fundamental research, that becomes our toolbox of ideas. Yes, papers are the mechanism of communicating it, peer reviewing it, and finding or essentially establishing ideas are valid. So doing that is important. Doing that at the highest quality, and that's something which Australia does really well. Hmm. There was a period when people were churning out numbers, but I think it, that conversation shifted five, seven years back. The quality of Australian output is consistently high, and that's something we can be proud of. And I think if you look at the numbers, we would produce three to four percent of the world's high quality publications for 0.3 percent of the population. Hmm. But isn't that kind of the point that we're producing all this really, really high quality research, but we've got this kind of problem that you're speaking to, which is one, lack of investment and in that that kind of research won't continue, and two, how we translate that research into goods and services which stay in the country. One, that they get translated, which is a problem in Australia, and two, that they stay here. So I think We've had this fortune of ramping up our research and our quality at the expense of certain external factors, like international student income. And that's not a sustainable model. Our pitch or request for the 3% GDP investment in R&D is to create the sustainable system. Anything else should be an icing on the cake which makes us go faster. But we shouldn't be reliant on external forces. And I think that's the risk we've created in, the, in our entire system. We don't have a model which fully costs research. We don't have enough local support for fundamental research. So yes, it may look like we're producing a high volume of papers, but it's been enabled by external factors, not by design. OK. Um, there is a bill expected to be pa um, passed in Parliament today, if it hasn't happened already, um, that will ensure politicians can no longer veto research grants based on whim or their own opinions of what is valid and valuable. Um, how important is this and how do we ensure the public has confidence in the decisions made by the ARC and NHMRC? I think the Australian Research Council under its current act has been in operation for more than 20 years. And they have quite a rigorous peer review process in the way grants get assessed. Sadly, the success rates we are talking about are 10, 12 percent up to 15 percent. So we are saying 9 out of 10 people are not getting funded. Mm -hmm. And so the majority of cases, peer reviewers are looking for reasons to not give a grant, not to give one. It's very different to what we think of as community grants. Mm. 
So once it's gone through the trigger, if grants are picked out randomly without the trigger, without the comparative thought process, it can create disadvantage. And that's one of the reasons the ARC had a review. Uh, one of the review panel members is right here. And they recommended that independence in decision making, but it's still oversight from the ARC board. Ministerial approval for very large programs which have long-term impact. So it is to strike a balance. But for the smaller grants, like I said, the grant may be funded with a topic a person may think is weird. But you don't know what the underlying objectives of it are, what outcomes it can produce. Just taking the Wi-Fi example, if they said, we want unscrambled radio waves, <laughs> I'm not sure if the, someone may say, why should we do that? <laughs> OK, before we go to our first question, I'd just like to say we might uh, be, if we've got time, we'd love to ask members in the audience today if they've got any questions, we'd be absolutely delighted if you'd put your hand up and let me know and then um, make your way to the microphone. But our first question is from Simon Gross from Canberra IQ. Uh, thanks for your speech. Um, I've been called a cynic now and again. You talked <laughs> about cynicism. But I, I tend to see myself more as a realist. When it comes to 3% <clears throat> of GDP public funding for R&D, it's not going to happen in any in the lifetime of anybody in this room or anybody watching. So I think we need to look at a different source, and that comes to the earlier part of your speech when you're talking about the industrial, the commercialisation and industrialisation of uh, Australian, uh, Australian research. Um, and that could generate a change in the culture of our private and research sectors. Um, you talked about strategy and boldness. I'll give you three obstacles that uh, the industrialisation of uh, our innovation faces, and you can tell me how the strategy and boldness would, would uh, overcome them. One, very high wages compared to pretty well all competitor countries. Two, very high energy prices and volatility in the energy price, so planning is hard. And three, um, getting approval for dirty uh, 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 factories, basically. So how would strategy and boldness um, um, take those three obstacles on? Thank you for the question. I'll answer the first part of it, about the 3% of GDP. Mm -hmm. Our expectation is never for government to fund 3% of GDP. Okay. It is, we want 3% of our GDP to be spent on R&D. And it needs to be a partnership between the higher education sector, businesses, and government. And like you said, government can never hit that in our lifetime by their direct spending. But they can create incentives which make people work together and put more dollars in that pot. So that's what we are after. Uh, currently, when we say 1.68%, that includes business investment. If you take raw government investment, it's way lower. I think it's 0.7-ish. Okay. Uh, so that's where we're going. The government, for every dollar it puts in, if it can create mechanisms, three to five dollars come from other parts of the system, that would be a big win for us. And so that needs the strategy and the boldness. We should not be trying to do any jobs where we are just competing for mass production. That will not be our strength. It should be high value jobs, high value services which are based on our IP. So the ideas, the intellectual property is where we can draw value from. So it could be businesses generating intellectual property which companies internationally license to manufacture or we manufacture the most special part and send it overseas. Let's take a smartphone for example. It has thousands of components. The Wi-Fi module is designed by some other company. The Bluetooth chipset by someone else. It's all brought and put together. So we can play in certain specific areas. Uh, when I talk semiconductors, there's a company in Sydney called Morse Micro. They design some of the most advanced Wi-Fi chipsets in the world in Sydney. So it can be made in any standard facility, but the wealth would come back to the country. So Focusing on such high-value jobs is the key, not the mass. But you were talking about uh, uh, PV uh, cells, and you were actually uh, uh, shaping the idea that Australia could be a manufacturer 
of, of solar cells in a competitive international market. But you're saying that isn't, that isn't what you're talking about. So I'm saying, say with the solar cells as an example, we should develop to, to the point where we own the IP, the design of how it's made. We would make the low volumes for our population, but then license the technology overseas to make elsewhere. But that way, we still own the idea and the benefits flow back. For every solar cell made somewhere else, mm. the money, a portion of the money would still come to Australia. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, but... but um, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a conversation. <laughs> um, Brendan Howe from Innovation Oz. Uh, thanks, Professor uh, Shriram, for your address today. Um, I just wanted to take you back to the comments that Peter Dutton said last week uh, discrediting the uh, Gen Cost report that the developments, which is led by the National Science Agency, CSIRO. Um, you described, um, you know, Industry and Science Minister Ed Husick as a kid in a candy shop talking about opportunities. I was wondering if you were surprised that um, Minister Husick hasn't made any public comments uh, defending the CSIRO. Everyone in this room as a scientist, the first thing they do is they debate. And like Simon said, all of them are cynics. When they see someone else's work, the first thing is they're cynical. <laughs> so any report which goes through the debate and the cynicism is pretty robust. And our role of, as scientists is to only work with the data, present the evidence. Any other decision making becomes political. That is the responsibility of the members of parliament to respond to their electorate, make a case. Um, so if you're expecting me to wade into a political answer, <laughs> that's not my place. But as scientists, all we can do is be robust with what we provide. And, and I just wanted to ask a question on the need for a whole of government uh, strategy on R&D. Um, uh, there's been a downward trend over the last decade, and at least government investment in R&D is now at a record low. Uh, I was just wondering, the University Accords calls for the need for a review of research investment before we start establishing this strategy. I was just wondering, you know, given the trend has been going on so long, do you think the government should have enough data now and the capacity to start making reforms uh, right now? And perhaps, um, do you think the government, given there's something like 150 budget line items across 13 different portfolios on R&D, uh, is there a need for a structural change in the government to deliver on a, you know, a more coordinated approach to R&D policy? I think the word you used at the end, more coordinated, is certainly one thing we would encourage. Uh, so each of the departments, like you said, there are 13, 14 portfolios operating research programs. They each do it to the best of their abilities. They each do it because they have specific priorities. So taking it too much away from them would dilute the priorities. For example, I used the Atmo capsule. We couldn't get funding from the typical Department of Education source or the Department of Health source, but it met a Department of Agriculture priority. So having a super org, which may not see those subtle needs, might be counterproductive. But there are opportunities to consolidate. What frustrates most researchers' grant applicants is each system has a different application portal, a different application template, different uh, ways you word things. Why? We are one country, same taxpayer dollar. That is the biggest opportunity I'd see in the near term. Um, the others, yes, they have to align to bigger pieces of work. M Minister Husick's office and the office of the chief scientist have been spending a lot of time consulting with everyone on the new national science and research priorities and a follow-up plan for it. Um, so those will sort of create stories which come together. But for me, the certain quickest win for the entire community would be streamlining proposals, how we apply for them. And did you think the government should start working on reforms and a strategy now before, well, instead of embarking on another review of the research ecosystem first? I'll have to see the terms of reference of a review before I can answer <laughs> that. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from John Ross from Times Higher Education. And I'm going to ask it, I'm going to paraphrase it. His question goes something along the lines that we're watching um, international students and a visa situation where student, we've got the highest refusal rates on record and um, visa application times have been strung out. We've been watching that with PhD students over the last two years or so. Um, how significant is that? for the Australia and innovation and science community, given that we import so much of our talent? 
That's a great question, and it's a bit of a complex challenge given the diversity of our higher education system. Um, and that's a challenge I've grappled with a lot, that we consider student visas in one pool. Um, because a lot of these student visas may be coming for trainee courses. They may be coming to private institutions where a lot more filtering is currently being applied, which is slowing down all visas. So I think sectioning them, say if people are applying for PhDs, that is obviously in demand. In most cases, there's a scholarship with a timeline. And if the person's one year late, one year of scholarship is lost. And so I think prioritizing those things would be a critical opportunity. And I think we have our National Reconstruction Fund priorities, other areas the government wants to focus on. And in most cases, if a scholarship is funded for a person to come in, it meets some priority. It means some, meets some funding agency or some industry priority. And we need to find ways to accelerate that. OK. Our next question is from Peter Birch, Talking Health Tech. Uh, thank you for your speech, prof Professor. Just asking this question on behalf of Peter Birch from Talking Health Tech. What specific actions could Australia take to attract and retain top healthcare technology talents and innovators? Also, how can we leverage our unique advantages to make significant impact on the global healthcare technology scene? I think Australia has a pretty good system of attracting talent. Uh, some people think people come to Australia just because it's Australia. No. It is one advantage. We have good beaches. But I didn't come here for the beaches. I came here for the offering at that time. And our healthcare system is very strong. Um, I was just earlier talking to Kylie Sproston from Belbury. We do some of the best clinical trials in the world. A lot of countries come here to accelerate their product to market. And so I think we do many things right there. Again, structurally creating visibility, ease of processes, no duplication of systems would be very helpful. In terms of attracting talent, one of the schemes which has worked in recent years is a global talent visa scheme. It is a real fast track to bring in high value talent into the country. Through COVID and post COVID, that's the one scheme I found has really worked. When you want a talented professional, a talented researcher, a technical specialist, it's one of the ways to go. So there are things in the system. Again, there's sometimes lack of awareness. Okay, next question, Morris Raleigh from oh, the National Press Club. Thank you. Um, I was reading today um, in the Financial Times, which is inside the uh, Financial Review, so therefore it must be true. Um, and there's an article there about small modular nuclear reactors. And, and, and welcome to the politics. Uh, 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 it's being supported by you know, Bill Gates, perhaps our best, best innovator of, in the world, uh, and uh, Warren Buffett, the best investor in the world. Right. So given that innovation and technology is probably one of the drivers of the solution to climate change, should we be promoting the debate in this country about these more modular reactors, uh, recognising that the politics is being played just up there at Capitol Hill? I think the first thing, as a scientist, I would say, we should be debating everything. If we hide from something, we will not find the answers we seek. With te uh, energy technology, when we spoke about the percentage of R&D investment, our proportion for energy technologies is way worse. So forget all the other ratios. We are not investing enough in both the fundamental research and the discovery. With nuclear technology, people think of all the older examples which were based on fission nuclear technology, past accidents which were more structural. But there are so many well-functioning, safe nuclear reactors in the world. And most of the researchers who work in this space are constantly seeking how to make it safer, better, more efficient, with less waste. And as we look at modular reactors and fusion technology, they're all focused on low waste. So I think it's a debate we should have. And like I said, we'll only give the scientific data then it's a political decision as long as they can convince their electorate. Uh, you, Carly you'll Walker. Make it here. You'll make it in Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> Carly Walker from the Academy of Technology, Science and Engineering. Uh, hello, Carly Walker. I'm the CEO of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. Thank you very much for your speech. 
Um, you spoke in warning terms, I think, of the dangers of Australian IP going internationally. But the fact of the matter is that we're a fairly small player internationally. And um, I, I do have a particular interest in, in this. I think that we have a danger of uh, missing out on technological and scientific advancement if we don't play internationally. Um, I also, it would be remiss of me if I didn't mention that we announced this morning with Minister Ed Husick and our collaborators at the Australian Academy of Science, a new Global Science and Technology Diplomacy Fund uh, to support innovations um, in Australia to collaborate internationally. Where do you see our biggest opportunities for international collaboration over the next few years? The first answer is solving science problems has no geographical boundaries. We bring the best experts together to solve them. And it relates to the question which Peter Birch posed about bringing in talent. So I think solving problems, we have to work globally. Where I spoke about IP is giving it away without protection. So secure it first and then share. And then any working system is a combination of IP. Uh, I used a smartphone as an example. The patents of the different components in a smartphone will probably be in the few hundreds. But it's all working together which creates a smartphone. So there's a place where we protect our IP locally, then we share it when it's protected to put it all together. Okay, our next question is from Dr. Tatiana Sors de Costa. Thank you, Sharath, for an inspiring speech. Um, so not doom, inspiring. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so there have been several calls over the years for Australia to spend 3% of GDP into research and development. So that's not news to us. We've been trying to get to that point for a long time. Can you please comment why it's so urgent for us to achieve this target right now? I think this conversation has been going on forever. Um, for a while, at least, we were stable. I'll say the last decade, we've been dropping. And I think COVID was a wake-up call, right? It highlighted our gaps in sovereign capability. We couldn't get anything in the country. And so that's one of the reasons for the urgency. We need to have some local capability where we protect and insure ourselves. The second one is, it is a technology arms race in some ways. Technology moves. Um, people who, like me, work in microchips, we talk of something called the Moore's Law. Everything doubling every 18 months. Technology moves exponentially. And so if we have to keep up, we can't keep having these conversations. We need action. And so this is pretty much a call to action. Thank you. And our final question is from Dr. Charlotte Berkmanis. Thank you very much for a very thought-provoking presentation. I'm the director of the Jock Clough Marine Foundation and a shark researcher, so that gives you a bit of background of where I'm coming from. It's going to be a little bit different. We've talked a lot about commercialisation and applied science and applied research, but for things like large-scale ecological studies and projects, where, what are your thoughts on where that sort of funding should come from? I think my shortest answer there is fundamental research is the basis of applied research. And our call, even in a lot of elements you see, I keep talking about, you never know what you'll find. So you have to keep investing in fundamental research. A solution you sir, find looking at spider venom can become completely something else, a healthcare solution. And so I think we should not overburden people by always asking them to justify the application. When I talk about streamlining application, that's one of the aspects. Yes, when if you're presenting a case for a technology development, focus on the application. If it's a discovery based, it should just be the scope of it. So I, I get what you're asking. I think we have to value fundamental research. Getting the government to invest in it fully in the current climate is unreasonable. We do need philanthropic bodies participating, especially when it's a social incentive. And I think Australia that way does very badly in philanthropic investment. I walk around the US, every building is a philanthropic investment in the universities and research institutions there. Uh, so I think that certainly needs to change in the country. The last bit I would say is, I think we also have to help people think through the consequences of our research. And so that is a responsibility with the researcher. The problems are not outside all the time, it's a partnership. Thank you. Okay, please join me in thanking Professor Sharath Freeland.